which is the second year of a joint Hudson Partnership for Secure America speaker series on nuclear security. Uh, last year, we held six sessions dealing with a bunch of important topics, the future of Russian uh, U.S. armed nuclear security, uh, the question of Iran, East Asian proliferation challenges, nuclear security summit, nuclear posture review, uh, and the NPT review conference. We'll be holding uh, a comparable uh, set of lectures this year. And then uh, and we're also partnering with the Stanley Foundation, who will take a special lead on the this, this session on nuclear material security. And then we'll do some outreach at the state level to try and reach people outside of Washington. Uh, and we want to thank the Connect US Fund, which is making this, uh, this possible. The Connect US Fund promotes responsible US global engagement through grant making. Uh, and related to pursuing foreign U.S. foreign policy objectives. It, their real focus is on community collaboration, so that's why they t help us team up with Partnership Secure America and, and indirectly the Stanley Foundation. Uh, and they've worked with Brookings and CSIS and a bunch of other uh, institutes in the, in the D.C. area as well beyond. What we're going to do, the session will proceed as follows. Uh, my colleague Andrew Semmel uh, from, the, uh, from the Partnership Secure America will uh, give the description of what PSA does, and he's going to talk a bit about the treaty, just a brief overview. Uh, and then I'm going to introduce the speakers uh, as, as they go. And uh, Andrew will go ahead and uh, make the, uh, do moderate the session. Uh, and so we'll each let people speak for about 10 minutes, and maybe one set of questions and exchanges among them. Uh, and then we'll turn to the audience. We know all you, you, the fact that you're here is one testament to how important this topic is. And we want to hear from a diverse range of views, and hopefully we'll, com we'll come out thinking we have a better sense of what, we're at, what the Congress needs to deliberate on at present. Uh, we're also, Hudson uh, has facilities for live internet streaming, so there are a bunch of people watching this over the internet. To allow them to pose questions, you can send me an email. I've got my computer up here, and I'm on the uh, internet. So send me an email, my last name, weitz at hudson.org, if you have a question or a comment, and I will try and read it out loud to everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew. Okay, thanks, Richard. Uh, as Richard said, I'm, um, I'm on the board of directors of the, of the uh, uh, Partnership for Secure America, which we call PSA. Um, PSA was uh, put together, uh, created about several years ago, um, uh, really uh, organized by former Congressman Lee Hamilton and former Senator uh, Warren Rudman. Uh, and the idea behind uh, at that time and still today was that uh, we needed to promotes uh, better bi bipartisanship uh, in the policy process. Um, what we saw at that point in time, and others saw, still see, uh, that the kind of uh, uh, partisan uh, debates we have can be destructive, I think, to uh, wise and careful deliberations on some of the critical foreign policy and, and national security issues that, that, we, that we face, and also in some ways undermine some of the institutions that are largely responsible for uh, for this de the deliberations on foreign policy and national security. So the PSA was, was set up uh, for that purpose, and one of, the, one of the intents and purposes behind it was to try to give some what we call safe space for elected officials and, and staffs uh, and so forth so they can engage in the dialogue um, and, uh, and try to come to some kind of consensus on some of the critical issues uh, facing the country. Uh, we have a bipartisan, uh, I'm on the board of directors, but we have a bipartisan uh, board of advisors uh, composed of 20-some luminaries, um, former secretaries of state, former secretaries of defense, and so forth, senators and, and the like. And we are devoutly try to be uh, as bipartisan uh, as we possibly can in terms of what we do. And one of the examples of this is, relates to this panel is, and it was that in, in June we issued a, uh, a statement on New START uh, signed by uh, some 30 former high uh, government officials, uh, secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, national security advisors, and others, uh, including the former chairman, vice chairman of the 9-11 Commission on this issue. Uh, if you're more interested, and I hope you are, uh, in uh, the Partnership for Secure America, PSA, we do have a website, uh, www.psaonline.org. Uh, uh, what I'm going to uh, just say, and I keep my words very, very brief, 
um, before uh, Richard introduces uh, our distinguished panel is to say just a few things. Uh, I don't have to go into a long exegesis here on the, the chronology of uh, the START, the New START Treaty. I think you're familiar with it, but just to uh, make sure that we have the, the sort of the, the background, at least, on some of this, is that you know the START Treaty expired last, about a year ago, December 5th, December 5th uh, of last year, along with the uh, monitoring and verification procedures in, in the START Treaty. And in April, and it was signed, and in May it was sent to the, uh, the Senate. Uh, by the president for due diligence and for the Senate's review of the of the treaty text. In mid-September, uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, after a series of hearings, hearings were held by other committees as well, but Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which has the primary jurisdiction, uh, voted out the treaty 14 to 4 uh, in favor of a resolution to ratification, sent it to the full Senate. Um, and uh, there were three uh, uh, Republicans on the committee who voted to for uh, sending out that resolution of ratification. Uh, in November, we had the elections uh, in which the Democratic uh, Party took uh, some, uh, some, uh, some de uh, defeats. Um, and we will see the implications of that formally in January when the new members of the that for future majority in the House and the uh, diminished Democratic majority in the Senate uh, take office. The political impact of those elections are much more immediate. Uh, as I think we all know from listening to the, the debate. And last week, of course, the Congress came back into its lame duck session, and the Senate is now um, uh, tasked with uh, a very, very crowded agenda, not just on New START, which the President described as a top priority last week, um, but also uh, a number of other issues, which if we wanted to, we can get back into that, are, that have to be disposed of. What we're engaged now is a partisan stalemate, uh, at, in the Senate over the new start. There's a game of chicken that seems to be going on between proponents and opponents, of, uh, proponents and opponents of the treaty. And I might say it's somewhat reminiscent in a distant way from some of the dynamic that took place leading up to the uh, vote and debate on the CTBT in 1999. The Senate has three choices very quickly, um, <clears throat> it seems to me. And this is obvious, but I want to lay it out nonetheless. Three, three major choices. First is to pro provide the advice and consent that it's asked to, to provide, the President asked it to provide, on the resolution of ratification. Just as it has done in past, on the START Treaty itself, uh, on uh, the INF Treaty back in the 1980s, on the Moscow Treaty earlier this decade, the Chemical Weapons Convention, and, and others. Or the Senate can provide its advice without consent. That is to say, it can vote it down, so not, don't approve the, the treaty can reject it, as it did with the CTBT in 1999, I think, uh, and, uh, uh, and the Versailles, Versailles Treaty about 90 years ago. The third thing you could do is postpone it or delay the treaty consideration. Postpone it, kick it back to, kick it forward to, to next year when there's going to be a new Senate, new Congress, um, and some of the processes that we've seen during the summer months and so on will have to be re restarted, not entirely. But the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee would have mm -hmm. to re-vote on the treaty and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. The composition of the Senate will be different. Right now it requires, assuming all Democrats would support the treaty if it got to a vote, it requires seven Republicans, or is it nine? Um, and I think it would, uh, in the next session, it would require 14. Only one Republican has publicly said that he would support the treaty, and that's my former boss, Dick Luger. Um, <clears throat> but I think there are some other support that is latent. Um, if the treaty is delayed very quickly um, uh, until the 112th Congress, um, the Senate could once again face the same three choices. Next year, it can either provide advice and consent in the resolution of ratification, it could uh, provide advice without consent, and it could further delay the treaty if it so chooses. There are other two other options that are out there. They're very unlikely, but nonetheless, let me just throw it out very quickly, and then we'll pass the discussion on to the panelists. One of the other options, of course, is to do nothing. Uh, that is to say, don't have a debate, don't have a vote on, on the treaty itself. That's not uncommon. Uh, there are a number of treaties that have lingered and languished on the, tr uh, on the Senate docket for, for a long period of time. When I was in the Senate, uh, I think we, uh, in the late 19... In the 1980s, we eventually voted to ratify the uh, to write advice and consent on the Genocide Treaty. That had come to the Senate, I think, in the 1940s. We think 30, 40 years later, we actually provided um, a consent on, on ratification. The other thing that uh, could happen, and I think this is extremely very unlikely, but I've seen articles. Jamie Rubin had a piece this morning in the New York Times, I think, op-ed piece. 
uh, in which you, the uh, supporters of the treaty, could engage in a Hail Mary. That is to say, you could try to find success through other means, through legislation, through declaratory policies, um, and, <coughs> and through executive agreements to try to accomplish the same kinds of objectives that in the treaty, and basically do an end run around the treaty process. Very unlikely, but it's still, you know, still out there as a possibility. Um, <coughs> such a process would require a majority vote rather than two thirds of key legislation. So let me just stop and say, well, uh, the panel um, will get into more some of these issues and more <coughs> substantive issues than I've just outlined, and hopefully we'll have a, a good Q and A period after that. Okay, just a, a couple more uh, logistical issues. Um, there's uh, food and drink in the back. The restrooms are behind here, so go out through the side doors and cut around through here uh, if you need to use them. Um, and uh, I, 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 I'm going to introduce the speakers, but I should have actually introduced Andrew oh. before I started. <laughs> so he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Nuclear Nonproliferation. I guess we all know him, so Nuclear Nonproliferation from 203 to 207. And as he mentioned, previously served as Senator Richard Luger, senior foreign policy advisor, and he served a quite long time in that for Senate staffer of 1987 to 2001. Uh, there's information about Hudson in the paper that my colleague Chris Ford uh, wrote, and that's on, uh, it should be on everybody's desk, and I saw him here. So he'll, I'm sure he'll participate along with the, the rest of us in this discussion. He's probably the, one of Hudson's leading experts on the topic. Um, this, we're how, how we're going to do it is the first speaker will be Ambassador Stephen Pfeiffer. He's got a PowerPoint presentation, which will give people some, in, uh, some background information as well as lay out uh, his, some of the key uh, points of his presentation. And then uh, we'll let uh, Stephen Began speak and then uh, General Adams. So uh, Ambassador Pfeiffer is currently director of the Arms Control Initiative at the Brookings Institution. He's a retired Foreign Service officer. He served for more than 25 years at the State Department uh, with a focus on Soviet Union and Europe. So he's, well, this is a good topic for him. It's, uh, he's, uh, and again, and, and within that area was arms control and security issues that he was basically working on. He serves as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, and a Senior Director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia at the National Security Council. Ambassador Pfeiffer, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me thank uh, the Hudson Institute and the Partnership for Secure America for organizing this session. And let me also say, uh, former foreign service officers or former foreign service officers don't usually new, use PowerPoint. <laughs> but because since I have quite a few numbers here, I thought it actually might uh, make it a little bit easier. So what I want to talk about is really the, the, the main security benefits that I see for the United States that would come from ratification and entry into force of the New START Treaty. And I break those down principally into five. Uh, first, uh, having New START in force is going to reduce and cap the number of Russian strategic nuclear wars that could strike the United States. Now, I have to say, I don't lie awake late at night worrying about a Russian nuclear attack, but I think we as Americans are going to be safer and more secure if there is a reduction in a hard cap on Russian strategic forces. Uh, second, uh, with the treaty in force, we are going to have a series of verification and transparency measures <coughs> that will give us considerable information about Russian strategic nuclear forces that we will not have without the treaty. Third, although the treaty is going to require a reduction in U.S. strategic nuclear forces, in fact, it will still allow us to maintain a very robust, effective, survivable strategic deterrent that will be capable of protecting both the United States and American allies. Uh, fourth, it's going to strengthen the U.S. hand uh, to raise the bar against proliferation. And uh, finally, it will contribute to a stronger relationship between Washington and Moscow. And I'll come back to each of these in turn. But let me just start by briefly reviewing what are the three basic limits of the New START Treaty. What happens seven years, or what are the limits the sides have to meet seven years after the treaty enters into force? The first limit is that each side is allowed to deploy no more than 700 deployed intercontinental ballistic missiles, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and heavy bombers equipped for nuclear armaments. That uh, add-on is quite important because this would not, for example, limit heavy bombers that have conventional-only roles. Uh, the treaty also uh, provides that on those 700 deployed systems, there can be no more than 1,550 strategic warheads. Um, and, and the warheads are counted a little bit in a different way. For warheads on an ICBM or an SLBM, it will be an actual count rule, which is quite a change from the START-1 treaty, which used to attribute every strategic ballistic missile with a maximum load. And, and this actually uh, works, I think, to the U.S. advantage because we will, over the course of the treaty, and we already have begun, uh, downloading our missiles so that few, if any, of our missiles will in fact uh, carry uh, their maximum warhead loadings. 
Now, whereas the treaty counts warheads on ballistic missiles on an actual count rule, there was an issue with the heavy bombers, which is neither the American Air Force nor the Russian Air Force typically deploys its bombers with weapons on board. The weapons are stored at the air base at a storage site. And, and so what they did is they came up with the rule that each bomber will count as one weapon under 1550. Now that does significantly understate what both American and Russian bombers uh, can carry. But that's actually a continuation of something the United States has sought for more than 30 years, which is um, preferential treatment for bombers. The rationale being that because of long flight times, 8, 10, or 12 hours, the bombers do not pose the same threat to stability or the same threat of surprise attack as do ballistic missiles with a flight time of 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, so there is this tradition of having of discounting weapons on bombers. Uh, the third limit is that each side can deploy no more than 800 ICBM and SLBM launchers and heavy bombers equipped for nuclear armaments. And the important thing here is under 700, you're talking about missiles. Under 800, you're talking about the launchers, the missile silos and the ballistic missile tubes on submarines. A non-deployed ballistic missile uh, tube on a submarine would be a missile tube that does not have a submarine-launched ballistic missile in it. So typically, uh, two of the United States Navy's 14 Trident ballistic submarines are in port for long-term overhaul, and they have their missiles offloaded before they go into a port for that. In this case, the launch tubes on those submarines would count as non-deployed launchers. Uh, let me now talk about the five reasons why I think this treaty makes sense for the United States. Uh, first of all, um, it's going to reduce and cap Russian strategic nuclear forces. Now, some have argued that if you look at strategic forces right now, Russia, in fact, has uh, a lesser number of ICBMs, SOBMs, and heavy bombers than the United States does. But I think when you're looking at strategic nuclear forces, it's not only what goes up that's important, but what comes down. You need to look at the number of warheads. Uh, and at the end of 2009, and, and we know this because the State Department sends a report each year to Congress, at the end of 2009, uh, U.S. strategic uh, warheads totaled 1,968. Now, that's not counting according to the New START rules. Uh, that's counting ballistic missile warheads and air-launched cruise missiles and bombs at air bases for U.S. strategic bombers. So it's counting more than one weapon for each bomber. Uh, at the same time, the Russians have not made a public statement as, as their forces, but the Federation of American Sciences, uh, Scientists did a look, and they said at the beginning of 2010, Russia probably deployed about 2,600 strategic warheads on its force. And that reflects the fact that the Russians don't appear to be much into downloading, that they uh, tend to uh, or appear to deploy their ballistic missiles with full warhead sets. Now, it's true also that the Russian strategic forces have been trending downwards. Uh, that's part uh, due to economics. But it's also, I think, part of a choice by the Russians to let that happen. Uh, I'm not sure that that trend would continue absent uh, the New START treaty. Uh, the second advantage is that with New START in place, because of the verification and the transparency measures, we're going to gain a lot of information about Russian strategic forces that we just can't get with national technical means, things like imagery satellites alone. The New START treaty has a set of verification measures that include a data exchange. So, 45 days after entry into force, the sides have to exchange a huge amount of data, including the location of every single deployed ICBM, SLBM, and heavy bomber. And that data has to be updated every six months under the treaty. Every ICBM, SLBM, and heavy bomber will have a unique identifier. And in addition to the data exchanges, there are a whole set of notifications. So for example, 48 hours before a solid-fueled ICBM exits a production facility, the sides have to notify the other. Uh, the treaty also has provisions so that each side may conduct 18 on-site inspections on the territory of the other per year. Ten of those are inspections of deployed systems, which will include the opportunity for the inspecting side to choose a missile of its choice at either a submarine base or an ICBM base, and then ask if that missile be opened up to count the number of warheads on it to confirm that number of warheads concurs with the information that the inspection team is provided when it arrives. Now, it seems to me that these measures are going to give us a lot more information than national technical means alone. For example, we'll have the numbers of warheads on each individual Russian missile when we conduct an on-site inspection. We can't get that by ourselves. We're also going to get information about how Russian strategic forces change over the course of time. And certainly, I think when you look at the U.S. military, they think that this is one of the most important, if not the most important advantage of the treaty, is having this kind of information allows the U.S. military to avoid worst-case assumptions 
and to make smarter decisions about how it equips and operates U.S. strategic forces. It also uh, means that that puts a little bit less stress on our intelligence platforms, which are very much now engaged in supporting combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, also watching North Korea and Iran. To the extent that we have these verification measures in place, that means that they have a little bit less attention they have to pay to Russian strategic forces. Okay, the third reason uh, why I would argue that New START is in our interest is that even after the reductions, there's still going to be a very robust U.S. strategic nuclear force. Uh, this column here is based on the numbers uh, in the U.S. force uh, that were disclosed in the Nuclear Posture Review back in April. So in April, we had 450 uh, Minuteman III ICBMs deployed. There were 288 uh, Trident D5 SLBMs. Now, you'll also see in the Nuclear Posture Review 336. And, and the difference here is two of our submarines, again, in port for long-term maintenance, don't have missiles on board, and that accounts for the difference. And there were 94 bombers that were designated for nuclear missions. Uh, in May, uh, the uh, Department of Defense came out and said, this is what our force is going to look like after New START. And they said the plan would be, and this is shown in the context of the 700 limits of New START, they would deploy 240 Trident D5 SLBMs. Uh, they said there would either be 400 or 420 ICBMs and 40 or 60 bombers. They, they have to decide those numbers because right now they come up with 720. I've assumed on this chart that they would deploy 400 ICBMs and 60 bombers. It could well be 420 ICBMs and 40 bombers. That's a decision still to be taken. Uh, then the 800 chart factors in the number of launchers. I, I think the Air Force plans to keep uh, uh, additional ICBM silos, even though they'll be empty, they will count as non-deployed launchers. And again, you have an additional, uh, in this case, 40 extra launchers non-deployed for submarines. That reflects the fact of two submarines being in port for long-term maintenance with no uh, missiles on board. And then you get the warhead totals. Uh, the plan that the Air Force has is that they will take each of their remaining Minuteman three ICBMs, which can carry three warheads, and download them so they carry only a single warhead. Likewise, most of the Trident missiles, perhaps all of the Trident missiles in the force will be downloaded. Uh, a Trident missile can carry eight warheads. Uh, it looks like this number here would have the average Trident missile carrying just a little bit over four warheads. Uh, the last comment I would make about this, uh, these numbers is one, well, two comments. First, the U.S. military has taken a very close look at the 700, 800, and 1,550 limits and come up with a force that fits exactly within those numbers. Uh, the second observation would be that this allows the United States significant upload potential. Now, downloading is when you take warheads off of a missile. Uh, so, for example, the Minuteman III goes from three warheads to one. Those warheads will not immediately be eliminated. They will be stored somewhere. And the United States would have the possibility, uh, for example, if there was a massive Russian violation of the treaty, to put those warheads back on. And, and my back-of-the-envelope calculation is that if it had to, the United States could probably go and add an additional 1,000 to 1,500 ballistic missile warheads in a matter of a few months uh, because of the upload potential. The Russians do not appear <coughs> to have anything like that because the Russians seem to be intent on reaching their limits by reducing and eliminating missiles, not taking warheads off of the missiles. The fourth reason why I would argue that this treaty is in our, in our interest is that it should help us in terms of raising the bar against proliferation. And when you look at the nuclear posture view, it said, well, there really isn't much risk today of a major nuclear exchange between the United States and Russia. What we need to worry about are the fact that other countries are acquiring nuclear weapons, and then the nightmare, which would be a terrorist group, a non-state actor acquiring nuclear weapons. A and the belief here is that there should be uh, attention devoted to raising that proliferation bar. Now, it, 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 it's important to be realistic here. Our ratification entry into the force of the New START Treaty is not going to solve the problems of North Korea or Iran. Uh, but what I do believe it will do is it will strengthen the American <coughs> diplomatic hand in working with other countries to raise the proliferation bar, because we ought not to worry just about Iran and North Korea, but there's some country X out there, and we want to work with partners to make it as difficult as possible for country X to acquire nuclear weapons. Finally, uh, the last of the five reasons I would say that this treaty is very much in our interest is that New START has made a big contribution to the reset in relations, <coughs> and you have a relationship today between Washington and Moscow that is dramatically better than it was two, two and a half years ago. And I believe that, that has had specific benefits to the United States on issues of key concern to Washington. So for example, as a result of the improved relationship, uh, the Russians have been more helpful on the issue of access to Afghanistan. 
Today, probably between 30 and 40 percent of supplies that go to support 145,000 American and NATO troops in Afghanistan are now moving through the northern distribution network, a good part of that going through Russia. And that provides for a much more secure route to move material to Afghanistan than going through Pakistan. Second, I would argue more importantly, uh, we've seen over the last year and a half a much tougher Russian stance on Iran than was the case in the previous seven years. Uh, the Russians supported the UN Security Council resolution last <coughs> June that imposed new sanctions on Iran. And among other things, that resolution included a, basically an arms embargo on Iran. I find that interesting because if you look over the last 15 years, the Russians have looked at Iran as a potential market for conventional weapons. They've now agreed to bar those kinds of weapon sales. Uh, also, and we saw this just weekend, this weekend when President Medvedev went to Lisbon and met with NATO leaders, there now seems to be greater Russian interest and working with NATO, working with the United States to explore the possibility of cooperation in the area of missile defense. So I think these are all specific advantages that came out of the improved relationship. I don't think we would have been able to achieve this uh, absent new start. Uh, finally, I would just make the point that I think when the Russian side now looks at the U.S.-Russia relationship, it does have equities in the relationship. And I think that gives us some implicit leverage. If there are, is an issue where there's going to be a difference between Washington and Moscow or a clash, there will be people who will be saying there are reasons to avoid that kind of dispute because we, they, on the Russian side, they don't want to endanger your equities that they have with the United States. So I would just close by saying I think there are five very compelling reasons uh, for uh, uh, moving forward with the ratification of New START. Uh, I would argue that doing it sooner rather than later uh, is important, uh, and that goes back to reason number two the information that we will get from New START's verification measures. Uh, we're now coming up on a year since the uh, START-1 treaty uh, lapsed in December of 2009. And over that year, we've had no inspectors on the ground, no data exchanges, no notifications. And so getting the treaty into force as quickly as possible is going to restart up that information flow, which will make us much smarter about Russian strategic nuclear forces, and I think is give us a greater degree of confidence in the overall stability of the relationship. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, um, the next speaker I'm very pleased to, to see is uh, you're, you're in Steve, you're in, you're in China, right? Until last uh, yeah. last week. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Stephen Began is uh, is uh, was served for 15 years in various foreign policy and national security positions in the United States government. Most recently, until 2004, as national security advisor to Senate Majority Leader Frist. Uh, Frist. He is before joining the Majority Leader. He worked in the White House from 2001 to 2003 as Executive Secretary of the National Security Council. Before that, he served for 14 years as an as Foreign Policy Advisor to various members of the House of Representatives and the Senate, um, and was on the Committee of Professional uh, Staff. Uh, and then he's what he's going to do is he's going to, and given that long experience uh, and uh, working particularly in the congressional angle across the aisle. Uh, he's going to share some of his perspectives on what we might learn from the way the Senate has uh, addressed other arms control treaties and, and what and really <coughs> suggest to us what scenarios might occur and then offer some uh, recommendations. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Richard and Andy. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here with uh, General Adams and uh, Ambassador Piper. The, uh, uh, in my uh, 15 years in the House and Senate, I did have an opportunity to work closely on the ratification of five major arms control treaties, and I'm going to talk a little bit about where I see similarities and overlaps in some of those. I was, uh, I was a European affairs staffer, Russian, uh, Russia and Europe, uh, in the uh, early uh, part of my career on Capitol Hill. I finished as Senator Helms as staff director and uh, on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and I w so I was uh, really present uh, in, in the, uh, at the crucible of several of these arms control treaties that were considered in the late 1990s. And, including the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and I'd like to draw some lessons from that as well. Let me first start with uh, my starting point, what, what brings me here today. Uh, I agree with everything that Steve Pfeiffer just laid out. I think uh, uh, I might modify, have a modification in a moment on, on the issue of timing, but in terms of the substance of this agreement, it seems to me to be uh, a persuasive case that this is a very good treaty. That it, um, that it does what it's supposed to do, that it will protect the national security interests of the United States, that it leads to an orderly decline in, in uh, deployed weapons on both sides, both the Russian and American side, and it produces the basis 
doesn't produce cooperation, but it produces the basis from which cooperation may flow. So I think it passes uh, uh, the basic test of does it serve the national security interest. But that's not enough, obviously, in the course of this debate. And there's a lot of politics around this, and there's a lot of debate. And I think uh, that is obviously where uh, things stand. That's what's playing out as we speak. And let me give you a few comments uh, on that. Uh, and by the way, uh, for my views on uh, issues related to uh, arms control, national security, uh, I'm not going to go into any greater detail than I just described, but I had the opportunity to cooperate with a gentleman named John Wolfstall, who's a foreign policy advisor to uh, Vice President Biden on a uh, bipartisan project sponsored by the Stanley Foundation, where we laid out in more detail where we saw the bipartisan consensus on foreign policy. So I refer you to that if, if it's uh, something that interests you beyond this debate is where where the thought is on bipartisanship in um, arms control. And let me say a word on bipartisanship. The bipartisanship doesn't mean that an absence of disagreement. In fact, there's very, very strong areas of disagreement among people on, on, on the means in particular around foreign policy issues. But I think where bipartisanship comes into play is an, a consensus around the goals in serving the U.S. national security. And so toward that end, let me give a, a few pieces of, uh, of analysis and and some unsolicited advice for some of those who are grappling with these issues in government today. First of all, on the issues that have been holding this agreement up, I think they're completely legitimate points of review. I think we have to demonstrate, the Senate has to demonstrate, that beyond a questionable doubt, beyond a reasonable doubt, the, the, the assumptions of a treaty like this are valid, that we have a, have a viable nuclear deterrent at the end of this process, that the reductions are are verifiable to a high level of confidence, and that um, any breakout scenarios, any worst case scenarios that might arise, can still be anticipated and, and deterred or addressed uh, with the uh, with the U.S. strategic weaponry that exists at the end of the agreement. I think that's a perfectly legitimate point of review. Second, um, I strongly support the view that we need a continued, modern, and robust strategic deterrent. I think it's unfortunately. Pollyannish to think that we are going to go to zero nuclear weapons. Um, the reality is that we can never eliminate the technology, and so we have to have the weapons, and we have to have them in a sufficient number and in a sufficient state of modernization to ensure they, they, pr they perform their basic function, which is to deter so that they are never used. I also think that it's very important that there be no suggestion that future considerations around deployment of missile defense be constrained by this agreement. So again, I think all of these are legitimate points of review and, and, uh, and legitimate points of concern for the Senate to resolve during its, during its debate. Now, the, really, the, the, at the crux of everything today, it seems, if we read the newspapers even this morning, is the question of timing. Not what needs to be done with this treaty, but when. Now, for the outstanding issues, the, the areas of review that I consider to be appropriate and relevant to this treaty can be resolved, then I personally have absolutely no problem with seeing this treaty move in the lame duck session. I don't think it's problematic, but I do think it's a serious issue to force this treaty if those issues haven't been resolved to the satisfaction of all parties. Let's keep in mind why we are here at this moment in the calendar. The Senate moved, but not with such alacrity as to get this treaty before the full Senate in sufficient time to have a debate which legitimately should be demanded by supporters and opponents of the treaty. We are in a post-election lame duck session where many of the members who are being asked to vote on this treaty won't even be serving in the United States Congress in the next session. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. There's certainly constitutionally, uh, they are elected and, uh, and legitimate members of the Senate. but. The supporters of the treaty who pushed it to this point bear significant responsibility for the dearth of choices that are available to us. Now I think that dearth of choices is somewhat exaggerated. I think the suggestion that if this treaty isn't passed in the lame duck session that somehow it will fall in the new Congress is really quite overblown and it's completely devoid of analysis. I don't see how you formulaically can forecast that 48 Republican senators in the United States Senate in 2011 is somehow going to be a less hospitable environment than 42 Republican senators in 2010. The same majority leader will be in place. The Democrats will have the ability to drive the agenda of the Congress. And frankly, 
as I look at some of these members, like incoming Senator Kirk or incoming Senator Portman or incoming Senator Coates or incoming Senator Blunt or even Johnson or Rubio, I, I just see it as a bit of a stretch to leap to the conclusion that somehow this treaty won't pass early next year. I'm not saying it shouldn't pass this year, but I'm saying that I think it's completely overblown to suggest that somehow it's hobbled by next year. But that's a bit aside from the point anyway. At the heart of it is how to resolve these issues and how to move the treaty forward on whatever timetable. Let me give a few thoughts on past treaties and successes or failures. And here I'll, I'll reference the five treaties that the Senate Foreign Relations considered when I was uh, in the Senate, on the Senate staff. Start two, Chemical Weapons Convention, the Conventional Armed Forces in Europe, Revised Flank Agreement, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and the uh, SORT Treaty, the Treaty of Moscow, the Strategic Offensive Reductions Treaty. Start two. Start two was considered by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and passed out by Chairman Jesse Helms, the the uh, uh, traditional opponent of all things treaty-based. It was a balanced and leveraged resolution of ratification, a subject of great negotiation between Senators Biden and Helms. Everybody got something. Nobody got too much. The treaty passed overwhelmingly in the United States Senate. The Chemical Weapons Convention, the next treaty we considered, was a bit controversial, to say the least. It was considered by Senator Helms and many of us who worked for him to be a flawed treaty. But there was plenty of time for the proponents of the treaty to lay out their case. They were well organized over a long period of time. They built a body of evidence. Ultimately, <coughs> they were able to gain the support of the Republican leader, then Majority Leader Trent Lott. And again, the treaty won ratification by a reasonable margin, albeit not as much as the START II treaty. The Conventional Armed Forces in Europe revised flank agreements was a critical extension of the CFE Treaty. Without it, the CFE Treaty was likely to fall for its um, failure to have modernized to reflect the post-Cold War realities in Europe. And in this case, the Clinton administration waited too long to send it up to the Congress. They sent it at the 11th hour, when the administration had no leverage but to have the treaty passed. It was a bit of a no-brainer of a treaty, frankly. The substance of it was, was not uh, hugely controversial, except for some of the uh, newly independent states in the, in the South Caucasus and a bit around the Baltic states. But the key thing was there was no time for the administration. The administration accepted a resolution of ratification that essentially blocked future extension of the ABM treaty, which then was in force. They were forced to make a tough choice. If they wanted the treaty, they had to compromise, and they did. Senator Helms was able to insert into the resolution of ratification a poison pill for the ABM treaty, which ultimately brought about its demise later. Again, because the administration waited too long to get it to the Senate, they were vulnerable. In the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, I agree with Andy Semmel that here you see many parallels. The supporters were not organized early enough. The treaty became politicized. It became a partisan issue above a national security issue. There were actually ads being run campaign ads being run during the debate on that treaty that only created a hyper-partisan environment. The supporters of the treaty had failed to do their homework in counting the votes, and they forced the vote anyway, with consequences that nobody really liked, which was that the treaty failed to pass the United States Senate, only the second one in the 20th century, as Andy pointed out. And not only did it not pass the Senate, it didn't even muster a simple majority in the Senate. That's politics. Lastly, the Treaty of Moscow, which was a bit of a no-brainer, frankly, as many people will describe New START. It more or less embraced reductions that were likely to happen anyway, but it was ultimately um, strung together in a treaty form to satisfy Russian uh, sensibilities because the Russians did also want a treaty-based mechanism to continue arms reductions. There's lessons to be learned in all of these, both in the successes and the failures, but I think the most compelling lesson of all is that don't force the vote unless you know where the votes are. That's too much to gamble with, and I think American national security is not beneficial from it. Let me just make a couple comments on the arguments that have come out in this, and then I'll wrap up with how I would go forward. I think uh, the, um, the critics of the treaty, the skeptics of the treaty, um, have indulged themselves in a little bit of overstatement in suggesting that somehow this process has to be a cure-all for modernization. That's too high of a burden to put on an arms control treaty, and you can't 
bind future Congresses anyway. It can be used in the current context to resolve some funding issues, and I think it's successfully been done already. It can't be used as a means to constrain China. China's not a party to this. China should be a party to strategic arms talks and transparencies and collaboration, but it's not going to be on the back of this. Um, it's not a gift to President Putin. It may be the case that in the end there is a better basis for cooperation in U.S.-Russian relations that come out of this, but we shouldn't ever do an arms control treaty because it's a gift or a, or a, a gesture to another government. We should do it because it passes the basic tests that Steve Pfeiffer laid out here, which I agree it does. And lastly, the inevitability of reductions, that these reductions will take place anyway on both sides, ignores the fact that there are important things to be gained from verification and from the structure of how forces are reduced so that they create more stability, not less, in the types of weapon systems that remain. Now, on the other side, I think there's also been significant hyperbole. This is not the launch of a new era of global nonproliferation. I agree completely with Steve Pfeiffer that no country that truly concerns us is going to follow us down this road on their own volition, but it will create potentially a better basis for us to collaborate with our friends around making those countries follow the road that we feel they need to. Um, this won't cause a reset in U.S.-Russian relations, and it shouldn't as a goal, but it may be a foundation, as I said, for more cooperation. So my unsolicited advice for uh, uh, those involved, for the administration, it's this. Don't make this a test of political manhood. Too much is at stake, and the risk is too high. For the senators who have been critical but are working still to re improve the treaty, my caution is this. This is the moment of maximum political leverage Having been involved in these negotiations between the Senate and Executive Branch, this is the high water mark. If you want more funding for strategic modernization, if you want more assurances on the treaty, if you want a reasonable uh, interpretation on its relationship to missile defense, this is the moment of, moment of maximum opportunity. The next Congress may not be less inclined to approve this treaty, but the next Congress is likely to be less inclined to spend money. I think that is a fair assumption. One of the surprising things I found out when we submitted the START II treaty to the Congressional bu Budget Office for a financial review, which is required of every piece of legislation or treaty that goes through the Congress, is that arms control reductions save money. I thought it might be actually the, the opposite, that disposal, inspection regimes, and so on. There are sizable savings that come from nuclear reductions. It was in the billions of dollars for START II, and I suspect it's significant for this treaty. Likewise, modernization costs additional money. So if you look at spending as an equation in the defense budget as a particularly critical area of scrutiny in the next Congress, it seems to me that you want to cut your deal now for the best result on strategic funding. For the outside critics of the treaty, I'd say this, easy on the hyperbola. This treaty can be dismissed as superfluous. You can accuse it of being oversold or even missing the point in some ways such as not addressing China's nuclear leverage. But it is a treaty that serves America's national security interests. These are reasonable reductions. They will leave us with a viable force, and we get to do it together with Russian reductions. And finally, for the outside supporters of the agreement, I'd say to stop overselling it. Take a deep breath and keep your eye on the prize, ratification. Be careful not to create a self-fulfilling outcome next year where a new Senate comes in that's presumed to be more hostile to this treaty when it's not. And so the way forward, again, if the outstanding issues are, can be resolved, I, from my point of view, for what it counts, um, I think it's perfectly fine to move forward now. The treaty has been carefully scrutinized, and I think the assumptions are valid. There's a very well-crafted resolution of ratification that was reported out of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and if necessary, it can be tweaked. On the issues of concern, on funding, for strategic deterrent. I think that negotiation is underway, and every negotiation has a middle ground. If, if the senators who are concerned about this are looking for more, more money, I'm sure there's a bit more to be had. On missile defense, uh, which has been an issue throughout, I won't go into detail what it is. I think for this audience, you probably are aware, but I think this is easily resolvable through a letter from the president to the leaders of the Senate, perhaps a letter from the president to the president of Russia. But ultimately, if the Russian government chooses to uh, interpret anything as a breach of America's commitments in this treaty, they have the right to withdraw from the treaty on their own definition. I think administration threats in getting this to move immediately can be very counterproductive. We have to remember, they have to remember, 
that it is where it is because other priorities took the floor over the course of the summer. It's not here because it was maneuvered here by the treaty's critics. And it's a needlessly partisan exercise to try to force this question if the if the if those in the Senate who might be willing to vote for it still have remaining questions. In the end, I think this is a treaty that wins with 80 votes, maybe 90 votes, maybe 90 to 10, whether it's voted on this year under agreeable circumstances or next year having resolved these issues. So again, if those issues can be resolved now, I'm all for moving it forward. But if not this year, then perhaps an agreement on how to move forward, the terms in which to move forward, to let the tensions and the partisanship cool down a little bit and keep the eye on the prize getting this treaty ratified. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a really insightful presentation. And the last speaker will be General uh, John Adams, General retired Brigadier General John Adams. He retired in the U.S. Army in September 2007, so he can actually stay, put forth his own opinions now. Uh, so <laughs> He's uh, currently an independent defense consultant as a, a, and a Ph.D. candidate, very impressive, at the School of Government and Public Policy, University of Arizona, and he also teaches there on national security policy. He was a foreign area officer, a military intelligence officer, and an army aviator. Served for more than 30 years in a variety of assignments um, and also assignments in embassies uh, throughout the world. His main is probably why I think his main contribution here was his, when he was deputy U.S. Rep military representative to NATO military committee in Brussels. Uh, because he worked on a lot of the alliance questions that we saw coming up over the weekend. Uh, arms control, also nuclear weapons, but um, broader questions about relations with Russia and so on. Um, and he uh, also done some other work teaching at the, the, the degrees in strategic studies from U.S. Army War College, Masters in VU. But I'm particularly interested in what you think the you know the European perspective is and how we, what will you read from the previous the weekend summit? Uh, what's what's your understanding of how that applied applied to the treaty? Thank you. Well, thank you, Andy, and Richard. Uh, Steve and, uh, and Steve. I, I really appreciate the chance to join this distinguished panel and thank the Hudson Institute for its opportunity to discuss this very important issue. Now, at the outset, I'll say that I am a supporter of uh, prompt ratification of the START Treaty, of the new START Treaty. Uh, and actually, uh, I'll get to uh, one, of the, one of the items that I believe uh, increases the sense of urgency on uh, on this moment, uh, why we need to ratify it promptly. Um, so while I agree with my distinguished colleague to the left, uh, that certainly we need to be judicious about uh, unnecessarily involving politics in this, I do think that the results of the Lisbon summit um, raise the stakes and give us that much more momentum that we need to take advantage of. And I'll, I'll just use a, a sports analogy for all the football fans in the room. It's like we're in the fourth quarter and we've got the ball on the 10 yard line and uh, all of a sudden we would just give the ball to the other team and just see what happens. Uh, and we're only ahead by three points. Uh, we wouldn't do that, of course. We're, we're, we're deep in their end zone. Uh, we're about to get this ratified. And uh, again, the stakes are pretty high. Um, and I, I think the, the, the results of the Lisbon Summit increase those stakes and give us that much more uh, momentum that we need to take advantage of. Um, as, uh, as Richard said, I was at NATO. My final assignment in the military was just the deputy U.S. military representative uh, to the NATO Military Committee. And while I was there, I had a chance to, among other things, attend uh, a number of NATO meetings and summits. I'll just mention two. Uh, I should mention I was at NATO for a total of six years. Uh, when I was there as a captain, I had a chance to make a lot of coffee, but I did watch the way things worked. Uh, and they invited me back as a Brigadier General uh, a few years later. And then I was there again working at the U.S. Embassy in Brussels. Uh, and of course, NATO being the, 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 the water cooler that it is, I spent a lot of time out at NATO as well while I was there. So nearly nine years in Brussels, a wonderful city, and I would love to go back any time. But, but I had the chance to attend two summits that I think are, are worthy of reflection on here. One was the, uh, or not a summit meeting, but it was the first meeting of the NATO Military Committee um, NATO Russia Military Committee in Moscow and our hosts were great and we had a, a, a wonderful reception in Moscow uh, and all I mean truly it was I mean it was there we felt privileged to be there privileged and honored to be there to meet with our Russian 
counterparts, and and I think they felt the same way. I hope we didn't disappoint them, but it was a it was a largely procedural exercise, and we knew. In fact, I had been lucky to go to the the Harvard U.S. Russia program, uh, you know, not too long before, and actually knew some of my colleagues on the Russian General Staff, uh, and it was nice to see my friends, and we had again a great time, but it was largely procedural. Our relationship in with it, between NATO and Russia has been that way for some time, and only in the last couple of years have we really turned a corner. Lisbon and the NATO-Russia summit, the NATO-Russia council meeting, was really significant, almost breakthrough in its, in its import, uh, and it bears on this treaty. Uh, the second summit I'll describe is the Riga summit in 2006. And that was, that was a very productive summit, and I, I mean, among other things, we, uh, we talked about uh, we talked about the first six months in Afghanistan for, uh, for, for NATO and ISAF, very significant discussions. Um, we talked about the NATO response force. These are all issues that we needed to resolve at the, at the Riga summit. But I can't compare the Riga summit to what happened over the weekend in Lisbon. Uh, let me tell you why. And I think, again, this bears on this treaty. NATO did a number of declarations in their new strategic concept in the summit communique and in the communique of the NATO-Russia summit that literally uh, both reaffirmed the aspects of, our, of the alliance that, that we depend on for our NATO security, but also uh, charted a course for NATO in the future to address 21st century threats uh, and to chart a course for a cooperative strategic relationship with Russia. Um, again, significant even breakthrough uh, results of this summit. Um, I'll talk about the reaffirmation of NATO's Article 5 uh, as it reflects uh, NATO's determination to have indivisible security throughout the alliance, specifically linked to the plans for NATO missile defense. All 28 countries, and this has obviously, you can appreciate the geographic challenge, you can also appreciate the technical challenge and the political challenge of all 28 NATO countries agreeing to develop indivisible security with a NATO missile defense system. And here's the breakthrough. Despite historical skepticism, Russia agreed to take a hard look at actually being part of this NATO missile defense system. It would be a NATO-Russia missile defense system. Some have characterized it a Vancouver to Vladivostok. This is exciting. This is momentum. This is really important. It'll be reflected in the near term in President Medvedev's speech, the State of the Federation speech at the end of this month. There's a lot of audience here in Russia, in Europe, and in the United States for this particular declaration that's made by NATO. And it is both implicitly supportive of a prompt ratification of New START and explicitly supportive of, a, of prompt ratification of New START. I'll just refer to the speeches that were made, some of them tr truly impromptu in Lisbon over the weekend, and, and I'm sure that the audience knows this. Um, and we've had uh, uh, the Secretary General Fogg Rasmussen early on uh, fully endorsed uh, the ratification of New START as the Secretary General. He did this in April, and he's been consistent about that. Chancellor Merkel of Germany uh, this weekend uh, explicitly supported ratification of New START. The foreign ministers of Denmark, Norway, Latvia, Lithuania, Bulgaria, and Hungary uh, all, and again, an impromptu way, in an impromptu press conference on Saturday, explicitly endorsed the ratification of New START. Now, they did this because they're thinking of the logic of the alliance security and of their own country's security, both. They're not appealing to partisan politics because they don't know, part, of course, the Europeans have their own partisan politics, but they're certainly not involved in our partisan politics. They're looking at the logic of security. These were, these were important statements by the alliance in the communiques and by the foreign ministers and by the, the heads of state of all the NATO countries. All NATO countries support the ratification of New START at the head of state level. Um, it's, it's, again, it's important to remember that the United States as part of this alliance has a, has a, has a responsibility of leadership. And it's no, it's no exaggeration to say that NATO and NATO European countries look to the United States for leadership on nuclear issues, on security issues. They want the United States to be a good steward of global security and to increase levels of trust and decrease levels of distrust. 
and that's what they see with this treaty. Yes, it is about verification. Of course, the NATO countries, European countries, countries in this part of the world as well, Canada and the United States, want to have verification measures in place for the 90% of the world's nuclear arsenal shared by the United States and Russia. So do countries of Latvia, Lithuania, <laughs> Estonia, and I can go on and name the other 20, 25 countries in NATO. Everybody's concerned about verification, no doubt about it. But it is that much more important given these really historic declarations and determinations coming out of the NATO Lisbon summit this weekend, we take advantage of this momentum. It's really something that new and that significant. Just tell you a couple of things that, the, that, the, uh, that NATO and Russia agreed to in the context of the declaration this weekend, of the communique this weekend. They've agreed, uh, it's, it's almost inconceivable if you look back the last two years, for joint theater missile defense exercises. Significant. They've agreed on a complete opening, Russia and NATO, complete opening of data exchanges so that they understand how our sensor-to-shooter links work, we understand how their sensor-to-shooter links work. Anybody who's familiar with those concepts realize just how significant that is. Um, they're willing to contemplate, Russia is willing to com contemplate, and they say so in the declaration, we say so in our declaration, we're willing to contemplate working together on missile defense and the Russians, for their part, for the first time, are willing to contemplate the United States as the lead for missile defense within NATO. Again, alliance-wide, indivisible security is the principle of a missile defense system. Significant. NATO allies are looking at this in a rational way. They're looking at their own security. They're looking at what is good for their future as an alliance. Uh, using Article 5, the, the collective defense of NATO from its very beginning as the principle that affects all of us, all of us in the alliance. And they see missile defense as part of that. They see not only missile defense as part of that, but they see building a cooperative strategic partnership with Russia as part of that. And we're, we, I think, have to take note of that here in the United States. I think that's that much more important for us to be those good stewards that the Europeans expect us to be. You may be familiar with some of the things that we're doing at NATO already before the, before the summit that's, that, that, that argue for uh, us doing everything we can and certainly not ignoring the progress that's been made between NATO and Russia on a variety of nuclear issues. I'll just give you a couple examples. Um, the the NATO-Russia Nuclear Working Group um, has, has already engaged last year in nuclear strategy and doctrine seminars and tabletop exercises on nuclear accidents and incidents. The next stage, as has been discussed between the NATO-Russia Nuclear Working Group, the next stages for NATO and Russia are transparency and confidence building measures that need to be, that, that, they, that both sides want to make sure that the nuclear arsenals are that much more transparent and predictable. Um, there's language reflecting that in, uh, in the new strategic concept. What would happen if we failed to ratify New START from the European perspective, from the NATO perspective, from our perspective as a member of NATO? Uh, well, first of all, it would destroy momentum towards the procedural cooperation that we have on, a ra on this range of nuclear issues I just talked about, uh, notably missile defense. Again, this breakthrough concept of missile defense, alliance-wide, indivisible security, and including fine Cooper to Vladivostok. It would also mean that progress towards a very great concern, the disparity in the size of the non-strategic nuclear arsenals of Russia and NATO would probably be very difficult, if impossible, to, to start discussing. And clearly for, for both sides, it's an issue that does need to be discussed, but the, the road to those discussions leads through ratification of a strategic arms treaty, new start. Um, there are those in Europe who are, now I should mention at the outset, uh, New START is an arms control treaty. It's, a, it, it's, it's about force planning. It's not disarmament. Now, of course, disarmament's not a bad word, at least not in my mind. It's, a, it's an appropriate context. That's not what this is, though. New START is about arms control. But there are those in Europe who want to move toward a more disarmament-oriented and disarmament-focused and disarmament-rapid disarmament uh, posture. 
um, and I, I won't mention names of countries here, it's not appropriate, but we know that there are those in Europe who would like to see us move to a, a much more rapid disarmament of all nuclear weapons. The alliance declared in its new strategic concept reaffirmed that NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. Our own United States nuclear posture review this past spring it re re reaffirmed the value on, and the, the intent for us to continue our nuclear deterrent, and I certainly agree with that. Um, but it's likely, though, and I think it's very, it's a, it's a great chance that if we fail to ratify New START, those who advocate a, a more disarmament-focused agenda will have uh, greater incentive to work harder for that, and that may present problems for our own deterrent. Um, the NATO European countries. Uh, again, they are also looking at us and our, our reset with Russia as something within which they would like to participate. NATO countries, each of them, different countries, different, in, in, different interests with, with regard to Russia. Many of them have their own mini resets going. It's hard to know what would happen if our reset were somehow knocked off track. But I think it's a good bet that the NATO countries will continue to want to have their own mini reset regardless of the success or failure of ours. Because the incentive to have a reset with Russia is in each country's interest. That's the way a lot of European countries see it. So I think we could expect uh, perhaps uh, that many NATO countries, many European countries would continue their own mini reset and perhaps in a way that would be, uh, if nothing else, uh, dis this articula in our poorly articulated within our own our own strategy and within NATO strategy, because there would be no 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 U U.S. leadership of the process. And finally, I think that there would be a, a loss of confidence in U.S. global leadership, not only on nuclear issues but on a broad range of issues. I mean, the, the the New Start Treaty is a modest step in and of itself, but it's part of a process. Now, again, we've seen the process. The stakes the stakes got higher this weekend in Lisbon. The process means that much more. Uh, and I, I think I told you at the outset, I, I support rapid, uh, rapid ratification of New START. I think that this weekend uh, has, has given it that much more incentive for us to act quickly. Um, I'd like to close with just a, a brief observation. Um, and I think this is something that uh, NATO countries, most NATO countries certainly would, would agree with. The, the reason the alliance has lasted so long and, and so well is less to do with the outside threat than in the concept of shared values. And I think that the out outcome of the Lib Lisbon Summit this weekend shows just how important those shared values are. There were some really difficult discussions that took place that uh, my, my, my good friends at NATO headquarters with whom I spoke with this morning said were not resolved until the very last minute. The reason they were resolved is because everyone who was involved in a negotiation among the 28 nations as well as the Russian interlocutors knew that this was, these were issues, these issues, these nuclear issues, these issues of strategy needed to be something that NATO addressed finally uh, to, to really address 21st century threats and to be able to work together for the future. I personally think this was an incredibly important summit and I think the, the outcome of it uh, bears, bears explicitly <coughs> on, on this treaty. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, General. Uh, what we like to do now, uh, the General Adams mentioned correctly that there are people who want to see a more ambitious disarmament uh, position, and uh, there are many people, including some people in this room, who are not comfortable with the START Treaty. So I wanted to encourage a dialogue uh, to talk to talk through some of the issues and think about you know what you got was sort of a centrist perspective, but from different angles, looking at U.S. politics, looking at the Allied consensus, but there are other issues we might want to consider uh, as well. Um, just though as logistic point of view, for those people, I've got one so far, but if anyone wants to email any questions or comments, just send them to me at weitz at hudson.org. And I'm going to let Andy do the question and answer. Please speak into the microphone if you have a question or a comment. Uh, but I also want to give anyone in the media a chance, because I know you guys have to leave early and file. If you have any, uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and do so, and then we'll uh, uh, we can go to the general. So I think you, you sir, you're from the media. All right, do uh, can we have a mic? Uh, who, who's got that? Do you want to come up here, please? Yeah. Right now, you take. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Todd Wiggins, Urban, <coughs> Urban Revival Media. Just as a general question for novices who are not familiar with 
uh, military strategy, how much of the, the ICBMs that are either based in the U.S. or abroad are um, directed towards Russia versus directed towards other points in the world? And, and are you familiar with uh, some of the, the first strike uh, strategies uh, that are they still relevant as they were post-World War II today in dealing with a North Korea or as you put it out, an Iran who has uh, nuclear cap capability now? Did everybody hear that question? Let's, let's repeat it. Okay. We're going to repeat it anyway because yeah. we need to pick it up on the microphone. I think the essence of the question is, is the panel, the members of the panel familiar with um, the uh, targeting of the of the missiles that are both located in the, United, the ICBMs and so forth in the United States and elsewhere, um, and to whom are they targeted and, and the like? I, I'll just answer that. If somebody on this panel knows that and says what it is, then they're going to have to be arrested. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I certainly don't know the answer to that question, uh, and I suspect that uh, it is highly classified and, and ought to be. It's not something that we would we would discuss uh, openly. I'll come I'll come in on the first strike uh, question. And the entire movement of arms control and of, of strategic uh, co cooperation on strategic issues has been to get away from first strike potential. This is particularly relevant to how you reduce your forces. For example, um, there are certain systems that are more supportive of a first strike, particularly heavy ICBMs with multiple warheads on them, which if you use them. You get the most bang for your buck, and if you lose them, you lose the most. So there's a there's a, an urgency to use those at the beginning of a crisis rather than, than hold back. The more the systems that are more uh, conducive to deterrent would be uh, you know silent submarines or or uh, undiscoverable systems. So the whole process of arms control has been on both sides, and this you know there's even additional measures like. Um, de-alerting, taking weapons off of alert status of the, even the hotline between capitals to some extent are all designed to minimize first strike potential. So the trend line in strategic uh, doctrine has been away from, from uh, first strike capabilities for a very long time. I might just add, I, I think uh, General Adams is exactly right. I mean, if we knew the uh, targeting plans, uh, we wouldn't be sitting up here talking to them about you. Uh, but um, but having said that, I mean, I, I think it goes back to about the mid-1990s. Uh, American ICBMs have been detargeted in the sense that they no longer have targets in the, uh, in the actual guidance systems right now, that, or I think they're targeted to uh, some spot in the North Atlantic. The idea being that if it launched, it would not go towards Russia or China. It would go to a spot where it would do minimum damage. Now, in, if they had to use them, they could then fairly quickly plug in uh, the new targets. Uh, on the first strike uh, question, let me, let me make an interesting observation. I mean, I, I think that both Washington and Moscow today think about first strike and strategic stability in some ways in very different ways from, say, 20 years ago. Because if you look at those considerations at the end of the 1980s, it drove each side to deploy over 10,000 strategic <coughs> nuclear warheads each. You know, and now we're talking about an agreement that would bring each side down to about 1,500. So. You know, I, I think certainly these sorts of calculations are important, but I think both in Washington and Moscow, uh, they're thought about in a different way than they were 20 years ago. Just one, one last thought on that, not to exhaust the subject. But this is an issue, you know, as, we, as we get to lower levels of nuclear forces, it's an issue that becomes more relevant, too, mm -hmm. because you run, you run the risk, in theory, of being able to have your, nuclear, your strategic forces decapitated, in which case you get below a certain level, ironically, you create instabilities in the system. So how those forces are constructed, the level of certainty you have they'll survive an initial attack, in some ways contribute to stability in, in maintaining a deterrent. A, a small enough force that can be decapitated forces a policymaker with a use it or lose it conundrum at the beginning of an, an, a crisis as it escalates. So these are very important questions that will become more important as we get to lower levels of forces. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to recognize um, you and, and try to get as uh, broad a uh, set of questions as we possibly can. I, what I would ask you to do in, in um, uh, being recognized is to, if you have a comment, please make the comment as brief as possible, 
And because I have to repeat the question, please make the question as clear as possible so that, so that I'm able to repeat it. Uh, and Good then we'll just, that, yeah, yeah uh, and, um, and, and we'll just try to get as many questions. We have ample amount of time uh, available for us, so uh, we'll try to get as many questions in as we possibly can. And yeah, I have one online so far. I'll one interject, online, okay. but we'll encourage more. Yes, so why don't we start over here, okay? Please identify yourself and then uh, uh, pose your comment or, and your statement. First, I want to thank you for uh, Someone who sponsored and hosted 1,500 seminars on arms control since 1983. It's nice when you don't have to organize them yourself. <laughs> uh, my question is two part. It has to do with I think everybody knows you. Could you identify yourself, though? Peter Hussey, the National Defense University okay. Foundation okay, and via strategic analysis. I have two questions. One is force structure that both uh, Steve and the ambassador relate, and that is since we're in a treaty where the SNDV level, missiles, bombers, and subs, is the same for both sides, and Russian systems are very heavily murked, if we go down to the next set, the pressure will be for us to get rid of an enormous number of our platforms, which goes exactly to your point, Steve. As you go to lower numbers of warheads, you're talking about very highly in unstable situation, which General Chilton explained in great detail at, I don't want to blow my own horn, but at my seminar that I hosted with him in September. Second issue has to do with missile defense. Bruce Blair and two retired members of the Soviet rocket forces wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs last month. They said the Russian view, if you read the preamble of the treaty, it doesn't say missile defenses in general, it says today's missile defenses that the U.S. has does not undermine security. It is silent on the issue of the future. His piece says that we should have no more than 100 interceptors that are capable of dealing with strategic systems. You count the 30 in Alaska and California, that implies 20 standard missiles aboard ship rotating in third, a third on station, third coming back and forth, a third at, at home port. So a total of 60 comes about 90 to 100, which is not going to defend against Iranian or North Korean systems in any way. So we have a hint that the missile defense limits the Russians are talking about, <laughs> given that Medvedev said any qualitative or quantitative improvement in existing U.S. missile defense is violation of the spirit of the treaty. We have two issues looking for the future. Will we be restricted to developing missile defenses against threats that Russia has no control over? In fact, there's some argument to be made Russia is actually encouraging with respect to North Korea. And second, if your SND DV levels are tied with Russian platforms, do you then basically have a problem with matching Russian highly MERV systems that aren't or not, which is very unstable? Okay, I'm not sure I can repeat all that, but I will just say in summary that um, um, on the first question is do, does the uh, current force structure, uh, which is based upon uh, uh, parallelism uh, in terms of size, is that um, uh, whether we pressure to reduce the the number of platforms uh, in, in in the future. Uh, second question was a little more complicated, and has to do with missile defense. As whether the um, uh, current configuration of missile defense uh, today uh, is going to be adequate for protecting against future um, uh, threats to uh, the United States that might emanate from Iran and DPRK. Um, that, that that's the essence of what I heard. That maybe that you can amplify on that during your question, your uh, response. Okay. Let, let me start on, on the first question on force structure. <clears throat> I, I think uh, if you look at what the U.S. and Russian strategic forces look like after new, assuming new start is ratified after implementation, the United States will be close or at 700 deployed ICBMs, SOBMs, and heavy bombers. Uh, the Russians are going to be at a significantly lower number. Their original proposal a year ago was for 500. And some projections have them going down to 400. And that would mean that if there were a subsequent negotiation, I think we could expect the Russians well to press to lower that number. Uh, and uh, the compliment I guess I would make on that is I think we would have to look at whether we would want to lower that number in the context of what uh, the rest of the other parts of the treaty might look like. It might be something that you know we would want to consider trading some reduction of the 700 numbers or concessions by the Russians and other issues. <clears throat> on the question of missile defense, I, I guess I took a little bit different read um, than you did from the, what the Russians have said about missile defense. I don't think the Russians are concerned <clears throat> about today's standard SM-3. Uh, if we, it, 
it, it, it, it's phase four, which is when the plan is in 2020 to <coughs> give the standard SM3 block 2B some some uh, capabilities against uh, ICBMs, and I, I think that's what worries them. Now, I, I think it's also, if you look at the timelines, uh, under the phased adaptive approach, uh, we would reach the spot of the time when the uh, standard missile would get, acquire some capabilities against uh, an ICBM in 2020. If the New START treaty is ratified next year, it would expire in 2021. At that point, presumably the Russians then would be say, okay, we are free from constraints if they feel that they would have to expand forces to compensate for missile defense. Uh, now, two other observations about missile defense. Um, I think it would be possible uh, to design a missile defense limitation regime that would, on the one hand, reassure the Russians and the Chinese, for that matter, you know, that there is no threat to their strategic deterrent, but would still allow the United States very robust missile defense capabilities against North Korea, Iran, and, and those sorts of rogue states. Uh, I'm also certain that uh, that kind of limitation, unless there was a significant change in what we heard from the Senate, would not be acceptable to the U.S. Senate. And, and so I, I think there could be a box at a future negotiation point, which is if the Russians insist on limitations on missile defense, it's going to be very hard for an administration to agree to that, knowing that that would probably mean that the treaty was dead on arrival in the Senate. Uh, therefore, I'm actually you know, encouraged by what came out of Lisbon this uh, past weekend with the Russians now appearing to be more interested in missile defense cooperation because it seems to me that perhaps the way out of that box may be cooperation on missile defense. Because if you have American, NATO, and Russian military officers working together on a daily basis on missile defense, you know, that's a great way to be very transparent about your capabilities. And hopefully over the course of that, the Russians might come to see that what the United States and NATO are doing are not the threat uh, to uh, Russian strategic forces that they might otherwise fear. I'd, I'd summarize the, the two questions, Andy, is how low can you go and what do we do about <laughs> missile defense? And on how low you can go, these are real questions that we'll begin to butt up against. Um, China's nuclear arsenal becomes more and more relevant as we have less uh, less of a deployed uh, force ourselves. I, I'm old-fashioned about the triad. I think you want the triad. I think it's stabilizing. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, at a certain point, you get much lower than we are now. You begin to erode a viable three-legged stool of nuclear deterrent. Um, I think demerving remains an important priority for us in creating more stability in the nuclear uh, relationship or the strategic nuclear relationship with Russia. And I also think um, we and the Russians have to contemplate asymmetrical reductions. It's not always going to be a one for one. So all of these have to be part of the conversation going forward. But you know, uh, past is not prologue. Maybe a, a good treaty, maybe a period of good relations, maybe uh, some improvements in the political climate in uh, Moscow produce a better basis for cooperation, maybe a, a shared sense of concern by the United States and Russia about some of the third party proliferation problems create their own dynamic and certainly uh, it's not out of the question that there would be a shared concern about the lack of transparency in China's nuclear arsenal or doctrine. So there's plenty of, plenty of, uh, plenty in play here, lots in play. On missile defense, um, I understand that that was the unilateral declaration of the Russian president, but I just point out the obvious. It does not bind it. That may be their view, but that's their view. And as I said in my comments, the Russian government has the ability to withdraw from the treaty for its own reasons regardless. And if these are the reasons they choose, so be it. I think it'll be a larger issue than that, but I think that's their interpretation. That's, that's their decision to make. I do think that this behooves senators who are concerned about it to ensure that there's some sort of counter iteration of that in the record, uh, in the in the resolution of ratification or in correspondence with the president that acknowledges that unilateral declaration, but declares it up front to not be recognized by us. Um, that's less important in terms of the current missile defense plans and more important around some hypothetical future debate where this issue comes up, where I can hear it on the Senate floor, that we can't fund that program because the Russians will withdraw from the, from the uh, New START Treaty. And I only say that I strongly support the New START Treaty, but not at all costs. And I think that would be the case for many members of the United States Senate who will be asked to vote on this. But in any event, I think our goal should be to avoid absolutes on missile defense at this juncture anyway. We don't know what the technology is going to produce. We don't know where cooperation will take us, as Steve said. 
perhaps cooperation will create its, its own momentum in this process. We do know, beyond the hypothetical, what the threats are evolving, from, particularly from Iran, but also from North Korea. And so that we do have to respond to. But I think we can have, say our, have, our, have our say. The Russian president has had his say. We move on to ratify the treaty and live to fight another day over this issue. Oh, I'll just add, because it's, and it's a respectful answer to your legitimate, respectful question uh, about the treaty. This is the missile defense language. Is It's in the preamble, which, of course, is non-binding. Uh, and it would be uh, a, po a possible, I mean, the, the treaty's not ratified yet, so the, our Senate hasn't taken its cut. But perhaps they will want to do some suggestion of non-binding language as well. And then, of course, in Article 5 of the treaty itself, uh, it talks about you can't load uh, ballistic missiles into, or you can't load uh, ballistic missile defense systems into ballistic missile silos. We don't want to anyway. We don't want to anyway. I mean, it's not, it, it, we, we just don't, it's not cost effective to do that. So it, it wouldn't fit within our plans as it is for us to, uh, to, to do what, what Article 5 prohibits. Um, and, uh, and the preambular language is, is simply preambular language. Yeah, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, read the question from the, the uh, internet, uh, particularly since the person posing is a former intern of mine, and I like my interns and try to make sure they do well and encourage any new ones if anyone's interested on either watching now on or uh, This is from Lauren Vandenberg. She's an expert on uh, Canadian. She's Canadian. She's an expert in Canadian NATO relations, um, and her question is. In the latest issue of International Affairs, Russian Journal of World Politics, Sergei Lavrov, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, mentions that Russia wants to expand the existing format of the U.S.-Russia dialogue and missile defense to include members of the so-called anti-missile school. I'm not quite sure who those are, but I think that the countries that are maybe uh, might, the system might be used against. The goal seems to be to turn the forum into a multilateral security regime. To what extent would such a regime overemphasize Russian security interests, or is this just bureaucratic posturing in the context of the START Treaty? Is this a good idea? So, any question about how, uh, where do you, I guess, I, the, the, in essence, what do you think the real goals of Russia are with respect to missile defense and how that might impinge upon the START Treaty or, uh, or not? Well, there's been, uh, uh, as uh, General Adams pointed out, there's been a lot that's happened in just the last couple of days that we're all going to need to digest and understand better before I think anybody can speak definitively. Um, the missile defense system is not designed to, de to defeat Russian strategic weaponry. So having Russia in the design or in the uh, participating and in, in benefiting from the missile defense system seems logical and could potentially be productive for, for pan-European security. So, you know, I don't, I don't see anything uh, at its face that's problematic about that. I think when you get into questions of command and control, of, of doctrine, of how the system is deployed, of the ability uh, of, uh, of any one party to frustrate the aims of it, I think those are very serious considerations. But I think we're a long way away from that. Um, I think we're just beginning a conversation in which I think both the Russians and NATO are going to have an opportunity to get a higher level of confidence in exactly what the uh, what the right formula is. So I wouldn't dismiss the Russian uh, participation as automatically problematic, but I think there's a lot that still needs to be proven out. Any other comments? Just a reminder, if you want to send in a question or comment, just email it to me at weitc at hudson.org. Greg? Greg? Greg Thielman, Arms Control Association. I appreciate the substantive uh, uh, comments on the merits of the treaty made by all the speakers, but I was confused by Steve uh, Vigan's comment about the process and uh, saying that we are where we are as a result of administration priorities. It's my impression that the administration has worked with great dispatch to get the information, the intelligence reports uh, to the Congress to make speakers available to the Congress in the 18 hearings, the four four or five uh, briefings, and that the administration very much wanted to have a vote uh, before uh, the August recess on the committee. Senator Luger wanted that, 
but the administration went the extra mile to provide more time at the request of the Republicans for answering the 900 questions for the record, more than twice as many as done in, under the first START treaty. Then uh, in the run-up to the elections, the, uh, the Republicans again said they didn't want to politicize the issue, and Senator Kyle said, for example, that we will have to wait till the lame duck session. And the goalposts keep getting moved back here. So I, are, are you saying that the administration, there is something the administration uh, missed in terms of its own priorities for getting this treaty ratified? Because it seems like it's just the opposite to me. They, yeah. they did everything possible to get it ratified with as, as large a majority as possible. Yeah. Um, let me let me repeat for the yeah, go ahead. let me re repeat the question. In essence, the question is that one on process and how we got to the current political stalemate uh, on the New START treaty, as to whether or not the, literally the question is who's to blame. In a sense, you're asking is it really the administration's intractability or is it the uh, re re uh, the, the opponents of the of the New START uh, the Republicans' intractability on this issue? Where do we where do we lay the the uh, responsibility for the current state that we're in on the New START? Uh, it it may be uh, uh, fair enough that I uh, overspoke and that I would say more generally, I think the supporters of the treaty uh, dithered a bit. I do think there were lost lost months at the beginning of the summer and into the summer that I think the effort began in earnest in the committee uh, somewhat late in the year. But let me let me say this, that uh, an anatomy of, of why it has been delayed these months um, is interesting. but but more important is how to move forward. And Greg, I'd say this, if the president a week ago had said, this treaty has to be done by March 1st, we wouldn't even be having a debate about this fall, honestly, in my view. I think this is a completely artificial deadline to get this treaty passed in the lame duck session. Um, I understand and agree that sooner is better than later. And I completely am copacetic, personally, with the notion that if the outstanding issues are resolved, people's satisfaction, that it can go in the lame duck. There's no, no constitutional reason that that would be suspect. But I don't feel that it's necessary. And tactically, I think it's potentially a mistake. Because if it's polarized into a test of political manhood, um, it's not so easy to get 67 votes in the United States Senate. So I think there's risk involved with an artificial deadline. And I think this deadline of must passing this treaty in the lame duck session is artificial. And I think the, the rationale for it, that somehow this treaty will be harder to pass next year, is a completely unproven point. I just don't see it. I don't see, okay, there's going to be 48 Republicans instead of 42. But if this treaty's handled right, this one's getting 90 votes, maybe 80. Maybe I'm being a little bit over-optimistic. Keep our eye on the prize. We want this treaty ratified. It doesn't have to be done this week, next week, between now and Christmas. It can be done by March 1st. And I think the arbitrary deadline is is uh, problematic. Actually, Steve, can I push you a little bit on that? Because, sure. I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say it's the end of the world if the treaty doesn't get it ratified in the lame duck. But I, but I guess when I look at the possibility of a new Senate, um, I, I am a bit concerned. Uh, I mean, first the numbers change a little bit, but even then, uh, as I understand it, the treaty would at least have to go back to committee right. uh, to be considered there, and then would have to go back out, and then you would have to, you know, spend a little bit of time at least helping getting new senators up to speed on this. So, uh, I, I guess my concern is, and then also not knowing what the politics may be like next year. You know, it may not be a matter of now or March first. It may be a matter of now or, you know, summer. Who knows when? And but, it, but it could equally be a case of never or March first too, Steve. Because you don't know where the votes are right now. You don't know that there's 67 votes in the United States Senate. I don't think the nose, noses have been counted to that point. Um, how many members voted for it on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee? It's 14, Three. 14 to 4. 14 to 4, and uh, uh, Republican members, I mean. and, and Three. Uh, uh, three. three. Uh, and one of whom is who's sticking publicly to his gun that he's ready to do it right now. Now, I'm not saying that it can't be done in that timetable, and I'm not even saying it. That I, I think sooner sooner rather than later is a reasonable proposition, but I think later is a better better choice than never. And I do fear that you can polarize this debate in a way that it doesn't need to be. Now, there's ways to get a higher level. For those who really want the treaty to go through, there are ways to improve the level of certainty. There can be an agreement. You can resolve the issues and agree that 
that it be taken up by a certain point. I don't know if a unanimous consent request is binding from one Congress to another, but I think the decorum of the Senate is such that if senators reach an agreement, they stick to it. That's generally the tradition. So they can reach an agreement on amendments, on debate, on a vote by a date certain. I can see a, a hearing in the Foreign Relations Committee, a hearing in the Senate Armed Services Committee, a report out of the exact same resolution ratification, maybe with an amendment that even makes it unnecessary to amend it on the floor of the Senate if the critics or the skeptics of the treaty at that point still have any outstanding concerns about the text. But I don't think that's an impossible process. And I think the stakes are pretty high to force it over the objection of of those who, who uh, have raised the objections. Now, you've heard me on the other side of that. I think the I think the skeptics of the treaty should measure their capital and their leverage now versus what they think they may have then too. There's a pretty good deal on the table in my perspective. I'd want to lock that in as well. So I think there's incentives on both sides to wrap this up. But whether the vote happens by December 1st or by March 1st, it's a treaty that's going to be in, in force for, uh, for permanence. It doesn't have a deadline. It doesn't expire, at least in terms of the obligations to reduce the nuclear weapons. It seems to me that a couple more months to deliver a more certain result is a reasonable, a reasonable um, proposition. If the votes are there, if the, if the proponents of the treaty feel that they're going to win, and they, they do it because they feel it's a huge imperative to pass this treaty now, Every day that goes by is a waste, rather than the desire to reestablish presidency in the post of an electoral defeat, which I think is the worst reason to do this. Um, you know, there's a basis to do it, but um, I'd be very careful. I saw it happen on comprehensive test ban treaty, and the treaty didn't even muster a simple majority in the Senate. Yes, I, Craig, if I just add one small comment to that, and I think to what was already said uh, as, as co-chairman here, and that is that uh, there, there's another major uncertainty that delaying the vote till next year, whenever that might be, whether it's March or June or what have you, is that anything can happen. Political, uh, there could be events out there in the world or in the United States um, that uh, could either work to the benefit of those who support the treaty and want to uh, ad provide advice and consent, and those who perhaps are opposed to it. We just don't know what that will be. So it adds a, another um, a realm of uncertainty as to what's going to happen during the interim. Uh, as, as, as Steve just said uh, right now, there we know what the situation is. Uh, an early vote would either work for or against those who are supporting um, uh, to get a better bargain on the one hand on, on the treaty um, uh, or not. So uh, there is that, that, that additional element. And I would just mention the CTBT that uh, Steve mentioned back in uh, 1990. That 1999 uh, was, um, and I'll just say this: it was the, um, it's a case example of how not to manage a uh, arms control treaty. Period. It was a debacle. Uh, Chris. Thank you. I'm Chris Ford here with uh, Hudson Institute. And if I could, I'd like to, uh, <laughs> I'd first make a, a comment, and if I could, a, a question. Um, by way of a comment, I'd I'd like to at least point out that it's somewhat ironic to hear Ambassador Piper uh, argue that one of the strongest selling points of New START is that it will leave us with a robust strategic force after. I think that's true, uh, but it's ironic to hear it as a selling point because we've heard so much in the Obama administration uh, ever since the Prague speech in April of uh, last year about how essential New START is as a first step towards much more dramatic cuts. I'm not sure how well the two lines of argument really coexist. One can either support New START because it's the first step towards dramatic cuts, one can support New START because it doesn't do dramatic stuff, but those are very different discourses that don't really go have very cleanly. Um, but by way of a question, um, oh, actually, in, in that regard, uh, Andy, I was struck by your, I was intrigued by your reference to the Hail Mary idea <laughs> of uh, potentially trying to accomplish New START goals by some other means if God forbid it should go through in the Senate. Um, and I recall it was about this time last year that your old boss, uh, Senator Luger, introduced a bill that would have legislatively extended Russian infection privilege in the United States. The idea seems to have been that if we did this and the Duma did likewise, then the inspection regime that is so important under START 1 could have continued until such point as New START got ratified. Uh, my recollection is that the Obama administration opposed your former boss's bill, thereby killing it, uh, and that uh, uh, you know, as a result, we don't, we don't have a continuation of the inspection regime. This is another way in which I think the lines of discourse being used by the White House to push New START may actually be creating some sort of practice that 
problem. I mean, we now hear very much about how, how terrible it is that it's been nearly a year since there has been a start infection visit and how essential it is to ratify the treaty in order to fill that gap. That gap is a gap which was in some sense deliberately created by the White House uh, for reasons that I find somewhat obscure. But, but it, you know, it points to the tensions. I think it goes to Steve Biggin's point about the, the, the key ways in which tactics and, and, and the ways in which one pushes things forward make a difference. And, and I, I suspect that in both of these regards, the administration hasn't done the cause of New Start as much good as it might. Um, to follow up on this last, as a question, I'd like to, to push the panelists a little bit more on the value of the, of the kind of transparency and inspection protocols that are part of New Start. Um, for my part, I tend to be more sympathetic, actually, more interested in those aspects of the treaty than I do in the force of themselves, or indeed in force like in general at this point. I'd like to draw you guys out a little bit more on that. We've heard from Beth Piper, but if I could ask um, uh, General Adams and, and, and Steve Biggs as well to perhaps elaborate a bit on uh, what we can, what we stand to get out of the new start, what the transparency and data experience perspective, and what less than all of this may offer for future arms control agreements that may come. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I would just say, Chris, since you referenced the point I made earlier that I wasn't, certainly wasn't advocating um, uh, end runs around the Senate ratification process, I was simply pointing out that there are those who've been talking about that as, as means, and you gave one example as, as, as Senator Luger's effort earlier this year, I think, in some legislation. The question is um, really talking about the transparency in the um, uh, the inspection process and what the benefits uh, are and, uh, um, in, in terms of the data exchanges and other things, and maybe you can elaborate on that by the panelists. Yeah, actually, Chris, I, I just respond to your, your, your couple of your comments first. Uh, first of all, I actually think that you can do nuclear arms reductions and also maintain a robust strategic return. I don't see it as an either-or choice. It really turns on the question of how you structure those nuclear reductions, and it seems to me that, for example, looking at the way the U.S. Department of Defense plans to structure its forces under New START by, for example, taking all intercontinental ballistic missiles down to single warheads, so they are not really attractive targets for a first strike. I, I, I think they're managing to do both. At some point it gets hard, but I think you can actually go quite a ways in reductions and reduce forces and still have a robust deterrent. Second, just, just on your point about the problem uh, stemming from um, the gap in verification capabilities. Uh, I'm not sure it was actually in the uh, ability of the U.S. administration uh, to actually fix that. I mean, people said, well, gee, why didn't they uh, simply extend the START-1 treaty? The START-1 treaty by its terms can be extended or could have been extended only for a five-year period. There, there's no provision mm -hmm. to extend the treaty for just two months. It's five years. And in fact, they, fi they fixed that problem in the new START treaty where it talks about extending new START for up to five years. The problem that you had on the Russian side was under New START, that caused the problem because of New START, I'm sorry, under START 1, START 1 restrictions would have prevented them from going forward with the deployment of the RS-24 ICBM. And the Russians were pretty clear going back to, in conversations I had with them back in 2008, that they were not interested in extending START 1 for five years. So that vehicle of a short-term extension of START 1, which I originally thought would make sense, wasn't available because of the terms of START 1. They would have extended the inspection privileges of the Russians to come here on the expectation that they would do likewise in Russia. It was essentially a reciprocal legislative act that would have had the same impact. De facto as, as rather a, than correct. theory. Yeah, it, right. I don't think it involved actually extending the treaty itself, but, uh, but I, I would defer to former Luger staffers on that more directly than myself. So. You guys want to respond? You want to start on inspections and, and transparencies? Well, I'll just say in. Uh, in response to the question on verification, as you know, uh, the verification uh, procedures that we have in place, or we had in place in our new start, um, they're actually uh, in, in, the, in ways that complement our own developing intelligence uh, capabilities. Uh, they're better now by design. Uh, and of course, the kinds of questions that would relate to uh, how those, how our intelligence capabilities are made better are uh, the kinds of questions that were posed during the question and answers uh, by senators to, among others, the intelligence community over the last few months. Um, and I'll just quote Admiral Mullen. Uh, he said that we have now a much more effective, transparent verification method with quicker data exchanges and notifications. And I think that obviously very general language, but that 
that's something that he, as the chairman, is comfortable with. Um, one of the issues that's been raised uh, most often about uh, the change in verification measures is the, the lack of uh, telemetry, telemetry exchange or the, the ability to encrypt it and then, the, and then the reduced amount of exchanges of telemetry. Well, you know, the, the, um, the open source information that we know is that we don't need telemetry as we used to. We have other ways to, uh, to, to track uh, missile launches and capabilities that we used to use Lemberty for. Uh, when my father worked for a National Security Agency back in the back in the 50s, that's what he did. It's old stuff, <coughs> and it's been. We've got different kinds of intelligence capabilities now that doesn't require either. Uh, in, we don't. We don't need to worry about it anymore. There are other ways, more more effective ways, of uh, getting the information that we need in order to verify. Um, there still are some, there's five telemetry exchanges under the treaty, allowed under the treaty. Um, that's more of a sample than anything else, but it does speak to you know, the, the thought of how we're going to do the verification, specifically uh, telemetry is, is something that's been given a lot of thought by the intelligence community in their company. And, and I just say in terms of relative worth, um, I, I think I, I recollect what you said, Chris, I'm completely in agreement that I actually like the transparencies in the verification measures in the treaty better than the numerical reductions. I think the numerical reductions are primarily a process to manage what's inevitably going to happen with these forces on both sides anyway in a way that leverages mutually uh, mutual confidence and does it in a way that is strategically stabilizing. But ultimately, if you ask me, for example, with China, what would I want? I'd far prefer transparencies, better understanding of their doctrine, uh, better awareness of what their what their technical capabilities are, uh, than uh, than grappling with the sheer numbers of their nuclear arsenal. If I if I may add uh, another piece on on the inspections, I mean it's not part of your question, but it it bears mentioning. Uh, as you know, the core of the Defense Threat Reduction Agency are the site inspections, and the people that do that are also, uh, you don't just pull them off the shelf. I was a foreign area <coughs> officer. I wasn't, a, I wasn't a Russian foreign area officer. I was a European foreign area officer. But, but I, I do know many colleagues of mine who uh, were Russian foreign area officers and who worked DITRA. Um, they're not doing inspections anymore. And they're looking for jobs, <coughs> either in the military or out. And that kind of skill set doesn't just come overnight. It takes years to train somebody to be one, a Russian foreign area officer, and two, a diligent, competent arms control inspector. Uh, and this core of inspectors have been doing this for 15 years up until December last year. Now we can, uh, and I, 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 I want to concede your point about timing. Uh, although we really don't know whether the Russians didn't want to extend this, we can't prove that they didn't. We don't know that they did, or at least I don't know. Uh, they may have said, no, we're, gonna, we're not going to extend the Start One Treaty, and, and we're going to have to renegotiate. I just don't know that. But the core of inspectors that works for DITRA needs to be put back on the job. Um, you know, their skill set, again, is, is, is a fleeting one. Um, and we don't have enough of them anyway. So it, it's something we should think about when we talk about how long we have between the end of START 1 inspections and the beginning of new START inspections. Uh, this group of people is going to do something else. Yes, back here. <clears throat> Uh, Bob McCrate, uh, George Washington University. Uh, I wanted to ask a two-part question. Uh, one had to do with earlier point about skeptics. Uh, it would be helpful to understand from the panel what you see as the primary basis for whatever number of senators may express skepticism about the treaty as it is now. Is it rooted in any ambiguity of the verification system, or is there one particular salient issue that you can anticipate the skeptics will point to? The, the second part of the question is, what do you think the effect of the treaty will have on nuclear modernization on both the U.S. and Russian side? Okay, the question is a two-part question, as you just heard. Uh, the first is, uh, what really is the underlying basis for those who uh, have some doubts about the uh, new start, what you call the skeptics? 
um, is it uh, is it the verification um, uh, uh, protocols or is it something else that's uh, lingering out there? Second question is what impact would the new start or lack of new start have on modernization of uh, nuclear stockpiles in the United States and in Russia? Well, I can tell you what Secretary Gates said over the weekend. He said that that if we fail to ratify new start, that he thought the uh, the nuclear modernization uh, funds that have been uh, broached, $84.1 billion, is at risk. I don't know what at risk means, except it's at risk. Um, hard to know what the <laughs> effect on the, on the Russian arsenal would be. Uh, I suspect it would be one that we wouldn't have any vis visibility into, uh, just because we wouldn't have any visibility into it. No more inspections. But I think it's, a, I think it's safe to say that one of the reasons why uh, the military leadership <clears throat> Our military leadership and uh, both uniformed and civilian want new start is so that they can plan around 21st century threats and not and and one we want to maintain the deterrent clearly we want to maintain the deterrent it's it's important for us to have that and it's important for us to have a safe and secure nuclear arsenal in order to co to accomplish that but we want to focus on other things we want to we want to focus on prompt global strike we want to focus on other we want to give the marine corps more marines uh, as, as the Marines would say. Uh, there are other things we want to do with our defense budget that don't involve continuing to resource a nuclear arsenal that was designed decades ago. So it's, it really is about uh, stewardship of, of, a, of a defense budget that, again, Secretary Gates uh, will, will quickly highlight to everyone it's, it's going to be it's scarce now and going to get scarcer. And for us to invest in, in an arsenal that, that doesn't accomplish the the mission of defending against 21st century threats is just irresponsible. Yeah. On the skeptics question, I guess um, if you go back and you look at the early hearings in May and June, I'd say eight or nine particular critiques of the New START Treaty arose. And my perception is actually that there were quite good answers to each one of those critiques. And it does seem to me that in July, August, uh, the ratification debate really shifted. It moved away from the specific terms of the treaty and became more about the issue of uh, okay, if people like Senator Kyle are going to support the treaty, what would be the commitment on the part of uh, the administration to modernization, both for the strategic deterrent, uh, the triad, and also modernization of the nuclear weapons complex? And it seems to me that really over the last three months, that's been really the focus of the discussion. Uh, if they can get that right, and then maybe some internal questions within the Republican side of the, of the aisle about how to approach this treaty, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, we're on a fairly clear path then to ratification. But I, but, I, but I don't get the sense now that there's any one particular question that really is causing problems to people in a serious way. Well, I, I, mean, the, the, I mean, there are people, uh, for example, the question gets thrown out about missile defense. But I, but I think, as we said, I mean, if you look at the actual treaty text, it, it raises missile defense in two places. One is there's this reference to an interrelationship between offense and defense in the preamble which is non-binding, which is a statement of reality. And as, as uh, Steve pointed out, I mean, the Russian unilateral statement basically says if they feel their deterrent is endangered, they will withdraw from the treaty. You know, they could wake up tomorrow and say, I don't like the color of the sky and withdraw from the treaty. There's, there's no, the treaty requires that you, or allows you to withdraw from the treaty on three months' notice if you feel your supreme interests are endangered. In 2002, the United States withdrew from the anti-ballistic missile treaty uh, and, and, and you have to give the other side of a statement explaining why, and as I recall, I think our statement was one line that says we are withdrawing from this treaty because it endangers our supreme interests. So I, I don't see that as really a, a, a serious concern. Uh, the second point um, uh, which the general address was this question about, uh, in Article 5 of the treaty it says you cannot put a missile interceptor into an ICBM silo that's been converted or on board a ballistic missile submarine. Now. We would not want to put a missile interceptor on board a ballistic missile submarine because if you were to launch it, you would tell the Russians and others, this is where the submarine is. It compromises the entire purpose of putting submarine-launched ballistic missiles on submarine, which is to have the submarines go out there in the oceans and hide. And then on the case of ICBMs, uh, we've actually done both. We, we built 25-odd uh, new silos for ground-based interceptors in Alaska, and then we took four ICBM test silos at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, and we converted those to hold ground-based interceptors. And those are grandfathered under the New START Treaty. But as the head of the Missile Defense Agency said, I did that. It turns out it cost me $20 million more per silo to convert an old ICBM silo than it does to build a brand new silo. 
So limitations that prevent us from doing something that we would never ever do under any circumstances ought to be limitations that we can live with. And so I, I think that, so when you go through the specifics of the, of the complaints, I think that there's actually a good pushback on each one of the um, issues that have come up about the, the New START Treaty. Um, I, I, uh, I agree with uh, uh, General Adams that uh, the strategic modernization funds uh, are the bird in the hand today. But next year will be two in the bush, as I, dis as I uh, discussed. I think fiscal probity is going to be a uh, major consideration in the new Congress. And I think any person looking for more money is better off getting it this year rather than next year for anything. I agree with Steve that there is no one issue, although it seems that the, uh, the issue of um, uh, modernization has taken the most uh, uh, time up of late. But I, there's no one issue. There's a handful of issues. I would be more broad, though, in what I consider to be related to the treaty. I think it's perfectly reasonable for United States senators to take a holistic view of how this treaty fits into our overall uh, nuclear strategy. Um, of, of removing warheads and the imperative of modernization seem to me to be two sides of the same coin. So it's not unrealistic to at least connect the issues in the debate and to look for some leverage if one has provided the opportunity. And I think the, the skeptics or critics of the treaty have been given a golden opportunity to leverage it and have been doing so to get some pretty good commitments on funding and, and policy issues too, I might add. But, um, uh, and, and so I do see those issues as related, but I also think it's a it's an overreach to think you're going to solve permanently the issue of modernization on the back of a treaty. You can't bind future Congresses to future appropriations bills, so you can you get the bird in the hand. That's why I think maybe you want to take it. Uh, we have one more question on the internet here. Yeah, um, the question I think it's a, it's a good question. Uh, it's the extent to which. Um, how could developments in, in uh, ABM, or what we now call BMD uh, technology, uh, affect the willingness of parties to adhere to treaties such as this? I mean, we, you know, we're talking about where we are now, but if you think of, when we're thinking maybe beyond this treaty to the next one we've been discussing about, uh, what do you think, of how could they, uh, could foreseeable develop trends in missile, tech, uh, missile defenses affect the levels people will be comfortable with accepting in terms of how low they would go? Let me talk a little bit about timelines here, uh, because I think that is one of the things that, bear, that bears on this question. Um, I, I'm, and I'm going to quote from Frank Rose, who many of you probably know, uh, works for uh, Secretary Tauscher, and made a speech to um, made a speech at the Atlantic Council uh, several weeks ago um, about ballistic missile defense in NATO and and, and plans to deploy the uh, SM3 Block 2B missile in Europe. In 2020, that's that's 10 years from now, and I, I just have to I just have to juxtapose that with the the uh, with Article 14 of the treaty, which says the treaty uh, will remain in force for 10 years unless it is superseded earlier by a subsequent agreement. Now, same number of years. Now, I'm assuming that the treaty will be ratified this year, 2010, 2020. We'll either get an extension, which can be agreed upon by the parties according to Article 14, and at the same time, we're going to see at least planned. And I, you know, I'm a I'm a military guy, and I and I and I know military timelines. And they're always kicked to the right by somebody, but we're talking about at least 2020 before the SM3 Block 2B missile, part of the planned U.S. missile defense plan for Europe gets deployed to uh, the sites in, in, in Romania and, and Poland. <coughs> um, missile defense is just getting started. I mean, we've gone through numerous iterations of missile defense technology. Some of them have performed well. Some of them have not. It's, a, it's no difficult task to predict that we'll continue to see some systems perform well and some not. Uh, what the, the, po the point of, of, of my comment is that we are in the early stages. Um, it, just as we're in the early stages of getting <clears throat> Russia to look closely at a potential participation in a European-wide missile defense, just as we just announced this weekend that we're going to have this indivisible security missile defense umbrella over all of NATO and Europe, um, you know, the notion of holding the Russians into that somehow in an unspecified way, 
uh, not determined yet. I mean, I'll agree completely with Steve. We've got to digest what happened this weekend without without de-emphasizing the importance of it, but also being realistic about what it means. Point is, it's gonna. We're, we don't know yet right now. Uh, we're, we're we're looking at a timeline for this treaty if it gets ratified of 10 years. We're looking at earliest deployment of a missile defense system in Europe, early 2020. Uh, again, uh, those those dates are going to get kicked to the right, no doubt. Richard, I I just add, I think this is yet another factor in the how low you can go equation that works both ways. That the the willingness of other parties to reduce their weapons may be a factor of the degree to which they think they can breach our missile defense system. And likewise, the degree to which we have confidence in our missile defense, defense system may uh, may factor into the degree to which we think we can reduce our weapons, um, none of which is, is uh, proven now, but all of which will be uh, in play in the future as force levels, in theory at least, reduce. Because then, you know, it's possible while the systems today aren't designed to, to um, repel attack from another major strategic power, you can hypothetically paint a scenario where the systems get better and the and the stockpiles or deployed systems get lower, that you hypothetically at least have a, have a possibility that that's any part of the equation. Uh, before we close, I wanted to ask one question. Uh, as a, again, the prerogative of, of the co-chairman. That's uh, there's been much discussion about the the U.S.-Russian reset um, uh, developments and um, um, those who are skeptics on New Start, obviously. And there's been obviously a lot of talk about the consequences of uh, e either ratification or non-ratification consequences, either in terms of improving and, and um, giving a further jump start to that reset policy, or in fact jeopardizing it. But I was I wanted to ask the panel if they could just give us some quick thoughts on how durable, how fragile is the the reset policy, given the fact that there are other shared interests out there, like on on terrorism, <clears throat> on certain no other non-proliferation issues, on the world uh, WTO membership. Uh, <clears throat> drugs and, and so forth and so on that the U.S. and, and, and Russia uh, have mutual interest in. And I just wonder if you could just comment very briefly on what, how durable or fragile is this reset if, in fact, uh, 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 New START is not uh, ratified. Any okay. Yeah. Well, I'll start by saying I, I, if you look at U.S.-Russian relations today, they're in a much stronger position than they were two years ago, and I think New START has contributed uh, in, in, in a large degree to that. That, that doesn't mean that there still aren't some vulnerable questions uh, in the us russia relationship. I think, for example, uh, Washington and Moscow have quite different views about what goes on in the post-Soviet space, uh, Georgia being a case example. So it, it, it's not yet the perfect relationship. Uh, but I do think it's a relationship that's made a lot of progress over the last two years. Uh, I do believe, as I said, that start, New START was a driver in that, and that a failure by the United States side to ratify New START would have negative repercussions for the uh, for the relationship with Moscow, uh, including uh, perhaps reducing our expectations as to how much help we could get from Russia on issues such as Iran. Because I think, I think what we've seen in terms of the Russian changes over the last year and a half, uh, I, I don't think that those were so much about Russian changes with regard to their perception of Iran as they were about responding to uh, a lot of uh, big U.S. push uh, to get them to take uh, more of a, uh, a tougher position on Iran. And they did that in part because they saw in the New START Treaty and the New START negotiation an American effort to address at least some of their concerns in the strategic arms control area. Andy, I could answer somewhat sarcastically that um, <laughs> we have a uh, strategic arms reduction treaty that's uh, now in place with an undemocratic government in Russia oppressing its own people and invading its neighbors. It's a perfect reset uh, back to 1990 uh, or pre-1991 in any event. But I would, uh, I would self uh, confess that that's a, indulging in a bit of hyperbola. Um, uh, reset toward what period has always puzzled me about reset. Um, what are we resetting to? Um, I think I would separate out the issue of reset. I think there's been important progress in U.S.-Russian relations. I think there's still some troubling areas of development in Russia that, that bear very close watching and, and cause me great concern. But we shouldn't pass this treaty as a, as a function of reset anyway, in my view. We should pass this treaty because it reduces our nuclear forces in a, in a balanced manner alongside Russian nuclear forces in a manner that we believe is verifiable and that we believe makes a net contribution to our security. So that's reason enough for me that this is a good treaty. If it produces some outcome that creates a better foundation for U.S.-Russian cooperation, all the better. But that's not, that's not the goal. 
I do agree, uh, on the other hand, that rejection of this treaty with, with uh, some level of investment by both governments in it at this point would not be a good thing for relations. But um, I don't think that's uh, legitimately a course that we should take anyway because I think the treaty is a good treaty. Well, I would just completely endorse what Steve said. We passed the treaty because it's in the national security interest of the United States of America. Um, we have to consider the effects of uh, non-ratification, uh, which, um, again, I would I would emphasize they they would be significant. The the, the, the various cooperative mechanisms that we have <coughs> only just a couple of days ago uh, been able to to uh, to lock in would <laughs> certainly be affected. Uh, we're going to get a good barometer of that uh, at the end of this month again when President Medvedev gives his State of the Federation speech. It'll be interesting to listen to that. Uh, but the real issue, and, and I, again, I completely endorse what uh, what the panelists have said. Uh, the reason to ratify New Start is because it's in the national security interest of the United States. It makes us safe. Okay, we are at the bewitching hour, but before uh, we um, uh, uh, adjourn, uh, let me ask if any of the panelists have any final comments they would like to make in terms of uh, wrap-ups or final statements uh, on what's been happening here today. I had my final say. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, okay, then please let me thank uh, the panelists for doing such a great job at discussing the issue. I also want to thank uh, the audience for staying with us as well as for the audience online. And as I said, this is the first of several uh, talks we plan to have on nuclear security issues. We'll probably do some regional security as well as some functional issues in the area of nuclear uh, security. So we look forward to seeing you back again. Until then, thank you so much. Thanks for your uh, PowerPoint. Uh, well, yeah, actually, it was the most substance nice I got in the treaty. I've been reading your iterations as they've been going over, yeah. the, over the couple of weeks. And, uh, that was yeah. very helpful. I tried to simplify.